took the beginning of the century, a 7.8% annual return not only beats the S&P, but destroys the bond market. So maybe they're taking a step back and saying, huh, you know, maybe we just load up on gold because that pretty well acts just like a bond. In fact, it's outperformed it. It has greater or lesser volatility right now. And we don't have to rely upon the honesty and the transparency of the West. In fact, there's no counterparty risk. We can hold it ourselves. In the ever-evolving landscape of global finance, the dynamics of traditional assets are being challenged by emerging trends, geopolitical shifts, and a re-evaluation of long-standing financial norms. In a recent video, precious metals expert Andy Schechtman delves into the remarkable resilience of gold in the face of economic distortions, suppressed interest rates, and the potential impact of the BRICS nations on the world's reserve currency. This video explores the intersection of economic forces, geopolitical strategies, and the evolving role of gold as a strategic asset. Schechtman kicks off by highlighting the illusion of prosperity created by years of suppressed interest rates. He points out that traditional assets, particularly the S&P 500, have exhibited distortions in behavior due to massive money injections. Despite the S&P 500's seemingly impressive 7% annual return, gold, often seen as the tortoise in this financial race, has quietly outperformed with a 7-8% annual return since the beginning of the century. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. It's remarkable when you look at it in that light. Um, the, the public in this country is too obsessed with instant gratification, and that's not even fast enough. And, you know, over the last decade, nearly, or, yeah, I guess you could say roughly the last decade, where cryptocurrencies have shown us the, the power of rapid appreciation, where suppressed interest rates, and really, when we talk about suppression, to me, it's all about interest rates, which have created a, an illusion of prosperity in this country for years, where suppressing interest rates and then throwing massive amounts of money over the last few years, which we'll talk about in a moment, has created distortions in asset prices. They don't behave the way they have over the last several years. My mentor, Richard Russell, used to say, if you make 7% per year, you are a rock star. Well... The S&P 500 since the beginning of the century has averaged 7% per year, though I guess if you've been in an index fund just sitting there in the S&P, you are performing like a rock star. But lo and behold, the tortoise in this race, gold, has produced a 7.8% return, annual return, since the beginning of the century. And when you add into it, Dunnigan, the central bank and commercial bank suppression of the market, when you add into it the massive amount of money creation over the last several years, the Western market um, uh, monetary expansion, massive. I think gold is well below where it should be, yet it continues to hold its own from a standpoint of value appreciation. And you know, if you look at, for example, in 2020, gold was 1773 an ounce average price. In 2021, that number was 1798. In 2022, that number was 1801. And in 2023, that number is 1943. We continue to see it holding its own. And that those numbers right there, you know, especially the last two, where it goes from 1801 to 1943 in 2022 and 2023 as an average price, comes in what is thought to be the worst environment for gold as of rising real interest rates. And so it held its own, very, 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 very much held its own. And, you know, when you look at it from the perspective that Rick Rule always talks about, that one half of 1% allocation in this country owns any metal, and he's talking on a broad spectrum from the Harvard Endowment Fund to Joe Sixpack, as he always says, the fact that it has held its own and quietly appreciated, even in the face of rising interest rates, what happens when we pivot and go the other way. Another proxy to look for, I think, when we talk about or to look at when we talk about just the kind of investment demand that could really propel things higher is when we take the the market capitalization of the S&P 500, all the market capitalization and compare it to the market capitalization of GLD and IAU, the big Western ETFs. The market capitalization of the S&P 500 of the 
um, uh, the, the S&P 500 companies total is about four trillion two hundred and sixty one billion. I think I'm right on that. It's about right. Think uh, the way that I, that I wrote it down was forty two thousand six hundred and sixteen billion. So would that be I think that would be four trillion two hundred and sixty one point six trillion. Anyways, point of it is, is that when you compare that to the market capitalization of GLD and IAU, which has a cap of 85 billion, that works out to 0.02%. So whether you're talking half a percent of, of people owning it or look at the capitalization of all the gold ETFs versus the S&P 500, in, in any respect, they are, they are, for all intent and purposes, effectively zero. And so if, 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 these, if the public wakes up and shifts just a few tenths of 1%, of their allocation that was going into bonds, into precious metals, or into equities that were going into precious metals, it will, I think, create a massive breakout in, in the price of, of gold in terms of its investment demand. But look, one of the things that has that I get pushed back on when talking about the BRICS and their attempts to make a settlement currency, which is not the same thing as a reserve currency, is that, well, how could anyone ever, you know, where could a reserve currency ever come from where the bond market would inspire the confidence the way the United States bond market has, which for years has been the most liquid uh, and, um, you know, safe, stable market? Uh, I mean, the first pushback would be after 45 years in, in 2023, the 10-year the treasury had greater volatility than the price of gold. Why? Because I think a good portion of the world sees what we just talked about. Little growth every single year with great liquidity. Well, isn't that supposedly what the bond market is? And from a historical context, holding a government's debt as an asset, it has a very short history in a broader perspective. And especially a government that is going to be issuing $1 trillion in treasury bonds every single quarter. A government that is, is, is choosing inflation over austerity. A government who has let rates rise 11 straight times, destroying the value of those bonds in circulation, and now is talking about going the other way. This volatility, the mismanagement of the world reserve currency, the way that we have squandered our image on the stage, the world stage. We talk about this every day, and I think we've lost. Schechtman draws attention to the years 2022 and 2023 where gold not only held its own, but appreciated in the face of rising real interest rates. This, he argues, is a testament to gold's enduring value, even during adverse market conditions. The video emphasizes the significance of gold's performance, particularly when compared to the turbulence experienced by traditional assets in the wake of interest rate fluctuations. A major focal point of Schechtman's analysis is the role of the BRICS nations Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa in reshaping the global economic landscape. He proposes that the central banks of these nations are strategically accumulating gold, making 2023 witness the highest gold purchases in human history. Schechtman suggests that the BRICS countries might be reevaluating the traditional reliance on U.S. treasuries and the U.S. dollar, especially considering the mismanagement of the world reserve currency. A good deal of that confidence in the rest of the world has in us. And so what I'm getting at is that when you see China and Japan and Saudi Arabia and Russia and all of these countries shed U.S. treasuries. What are they doing with their excess reserves? They're buying gold. And that's why you see over the last two years, the central banks buying more gold than at any time in human history. And if we look at the performance over the last two years, what did I say it was? It was uh, 1801 average price in 2022, 1943 in, in 2023. You go back over the last to the beginning of the century. A 7.8% annual return not only beats the S&P, but destroys the bond market. So maybe they're taking a step back and saying, huh, you know, maybe we just load up on gold because that pretty well acts just like a bond. In fact, it's outperformed it. It has greater or lesser volatility right now. And we don't have to rely upon the honesty and the transparency of the West. In fact, there's no counterparty risk. We can hold it ourselves. And so when you realize this, this transformation of, I think, of attitude and of reality where gold is holding its own, but I think it's actually catching the attention of a lot of nations around the world who are shedding U.S. treasuries 
and in favor of gold, as crazy as that sounds. But what did the BIS call it? Oh, yeah, the only other tier one asset in the world alongside U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries. So if you want to break reliance on the Western system and on the Western hegemony, well, certainly pricing goods in other currencies for settlement chips away at the settlement of the U.S. dollar. And what did we see last year? 2023, over 20% of all oil sales in other currencies, right? They're chipping away. All of these deals we see settling in other currencies, chipping away. And how about the reserve status? Well, you keep beating up and chipping away at the settlement status, it's gonna have effect on the reserve status. But I do honestly believe that a lot of these governments view gold by looking at its performance over the last 20 plus years as, as maybe even a better alternative to treasuries. Now, the one thing they don't have would be that immediate liquidity, but they do. I mean, you have to move it from storage. And that's, that's always why they these countries have kept gold at, at the Bank of England and the New York Fed, because they're the trading homes where they, where they can just move it from one vault or one pile to another and then get paid. The video introduces the concept of chipping away at the settlement status of the U.S. dollar, citing examples such as over 20% of oil sales occurring in other currencies in 2023. Schechtman argues that this erosion of the dollar supremacy is a gradual process, fueled by an increasing number of countries trading in local currencies and participating in the BRICS agenda. He discusses the possibility of these nations issuing a common settlement currency, potentially backed by gold, challenging the traditional dominance of the Western financial system. As the BRICS nations shift away from US treasuries, Schechtman proposes that gold could emerge as a superior alternative. He cites gold's historical performance, its status as the only other tier one asset alongside US dollars and treasuries, and its lower volatility compared to the 10-year treasury. The video suggests that the BRICS nations might find gold to be a reliable store of value with no counterparty risk, offering a strategic hedge against the uncertainties of the Western financial system. But I do think that there is a, a shift, a gradual shift that most of the dollar bulls don't notice yet. And, you know, um, I think the dollar milkshake theory has been spot on. I think he's a smart dude, Brent Johnson. I think he, he's he been right. But I think little by little by little by little, logarithmic decay again, that, that's my favorite term in so many things I look at around the world, is chipping away not only at the settlement status, but this move to gold, which has held its own against the S&P and bettered supposedly the most liquid stable market in the world that now has actually less volatility than the 10-year treasury, I think is beginning to take on a different view uh, or, or a different image with the rest of the world. So I think what that, that question is something people really need to think about. You do not need to issue a currency with a reserve standard in order to, to greatly affect the reserve standard of the US dollar. You can issue or trade in local currencies and especially when you look at all of the countries joining the BRICS, another 30, according to Putin, have formally applied. I thought it was 20. He says 30 and up to another 20 informally. This massive swath of humanity joining this, this group and settling right now. Remember, that was the, the deal. We, we're going to task the finance ministers to go back to the drawing board, come back to the meeting in, in October in Russia. There's over 200 meetings in Russia this year, all about BRICS. But the big one is in October, where they are gonna come back and present their findings. But in the meantime, they're all trading in each other's currencies with one another. Sure, the dollar is still the world reserve. Sure, the dollar is still the, the emperor, who maybe has no clothes. But the point of it is, is that you are beginning to see the chipping away of the settlement status of the dollar in favor of local currencies. And ultimately, the BRICS could issue not only a common settlement currency or just a decree that if you want to trade with the BRICS nations, it has to either be in gold or in local currencies and until we issue a common settlement currency. And maybe someday they issue a reserve currency or a bond market to challenge the West. But in the meantime, I think, and if you look at the numbers, they really don't lie, that gold could indeed represent that that hole that is would be uh, in place if they shift away from taking the reserves or the excess that was part of the petro deal will we'll, you value oil in dollars and take the excess and put it in treasuries well if you 
remove the treasury aspect and put it into the other tier one asset gold with no counterparty liability and breaking free from the Western hegemony as they all want to do. To me, I think that's on the table. That's a playbook that I think you'll see more and more of here in 2024.